We would like to begin the second general session presentations with the Interscholastic Unified Sports Report from Tim Shriver, Chairman of the Board and CEO of Special Olympics. Please welcome Tim to the podium. Wow, I did, we didn't even get to have, sip our coffee before I had to come up here. And I thought there were going to be lots of proceedings and votes and all these kinds of things. But thank you, Sherm. Thank you, Bob, uh, Kevin, uh, Jim. Uh, congratulations to all of you for your leadership. I want to also thank Tim Flannery, who's been such a great supporter um, of the Special Olympics movement. Uh, my colleagues here from Special Olympics Colorado and Brian Quinn from our international office and all the folks in uh, the Colorado Association who've worked so hard for the conference. Uh, I was here last night. I didn't lose anything. I didn't, uh, I didn't get defeated in the tournament, but uh, I got to enjoy some of the hospitality, and obviously the conference is off uh, to a great start. It's a real honor for me and for the Special Olympics movement to have a few minutes of your time. I hope you've got a good shot of caffeine and, and, uh, and had a good night's rest. Uh, I hope to share with you just for 15 or so minutes this morning a little view of, of where we come from and where we hope our two organizations can come together over the next years and even decades uh, to lead what I think of as a revolution. Let me start by uh, sharing a, a quick story of my own life and career as a participant in Special Olympics Unified Sports. I'll talk a little bit more about Unified in a minute, but just so you know that I'm not always a sideline or I don't always wear a sport coat. I was on a unified softball team when I lived in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, uh, I played second base. We had five athletes on that team who had intellectual challenges and four of us who had other kinds of challenges but uh, didn't have intellectual challenges. And the first year we, we competed, we won the state championships. We won the gold medal. And we dethroned the longtime champion Waterbury Special Olympics. And for those of you who know Connecticut, New Haven and Waterbury are rivals in the state in so many ways. And uh, it was a triumphant victory for us. And, and so the next season rolls around, and in preliminaries, we're playing Waterbury. And Waterbury really wanted revenge badly. And I'm playing second base, and the biggest player, the first baseman for Waterbury, comes up to bat. He's a big right-hander. And he slams a hard line drive right at me. And uh, for those of you who are softball players, you'll know this, but I, hadn't, I wasn't good enough to know this. It was a low line drive, but it had backspin on it. So it, it rose instead of going down. And I went down to field it, and the ball rose and hit me full strength right in the mouth. Um, and I was down on my back, and I, I was sort of conscious, thinking to myself, you know, my teeth are gone. I could feel blood coming out of my nose. My nose is broken. My teeth are gone. This is a disaster. So I'm sort of grasping around here. I'm kind of in a fog. Everybody crowds around me, helps me back up. I, I feel my teeth are there. You know, I dab the, the blood off my nose, and I kind of come to, and... I'm okay, I'm okay, my mouth is all in order. And I look at the, sec the, the, the hitter, he's standing on second base. Uh, he's hugging second. And I look at him and as I sort of shake it off and everybody says, okay, let's play again, I say, wow, I said, that was, that was a good hit. And he says, yeah? He says, I'm going to kick your ass in states too this year. <laughs> So I, I share that story because a lot of people think of Special Olympics as sweet and kind and lovely and generous, and I was expecting, I have to say, a different response from him when I came to and all my guts and courage. But um, I think that the message is that I'm hoping each of you will find a chance uh, through our movement to kick a little butt uh, and to enjoy the, the power and, and passion of the Special Olympics movement. Um, you, you'll see the, f the, first, the first question, let me go back because I didn't get a chance to make sure uh, you saw the question. Is it possible to have an undefeated season, every season? Um, and we're going to start with a quiz. I'm a teacher, not as much a coach. So there's three pictures coming up, and I want you to make a mental note. The papers won't be collected, but scores will be taken. The question on each of the next three pictures is, which of the two people on the page is the Special Olympics athlete? This is a test we try to do to remind people of some of their prejudices and maybe uh, unconscious ways of seeing the world. So you're going to keep, keep track in your own mind, left or right, which of these two athletes is the Special Olympics athlete? I told you grades are going to be given, so don't, don't ignore me here. There's three questions. There's three quizzes. Which of these two, left or right, 
is the Special Olympics athlete. And which of these two, slightly left or slightly right, is the Special Olympics athlete? We'll come back to that. Let me just tell you just a, for a minute here a little bit about the movement. Uh, many of you, many of you I got to meet last night, you know the Special Olympics movement. What you may not know is the numbers, uh, the reach. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but this is our analysis we do every year of our reach around the world. Just over 4.2 million athletes participated last year in the Special Olympics movement. The next number to the right is one I find stunning. As many of you know, most of our games are led by volunteers. 70,000 competitions last year carrying the Special Olympics banner from China to Macau to Bangladesh to Pakistan and India, Afghanistan and Rwanda, Brazil and Peru and Ecuador, Mexico, the United States, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, I could go on and on. 70,000 competitions last year, uh, almost half a million registered coaches who help lead those competitions. Uh, you'll see in the green box down below what many of you might not know, which is that we are now the largest health screening and public health education program in the world for people with intellectual disabilities. Over 100,000 health screenings last year at our games uh, and our unified sports program, which I'll talk a little bit more about in blue, uh, growing significantly last year. Uh, over a quarter of a million uh, young people participating in unified sports. These numbers speak to a movement that I would say is still quite young. Why, are we, why do we exist? Here's a poster. Uh, we've seen these posters. They're designed to inspire people. They read words often like compassion or teamwork or courage or guts. This one has these two birds and the word below says retards. Everybody, we all know one. What you may be surprised to know is that this poster was hanging in the faculty lounge at the Children's National Hospital last year. The hospital which has as its mission to care for children who have significant illnesses. Uh, I share it with you to remind us all uh, that the subtle prejudice, the subtle discrimination that uh, so oppresses and so constrains the lives of people with intellectual disabilities is all around us and sometimes we don't even notice it. I would say even with this word, uh, we started this campaign about five years ago to sensitize young people to the use of the word retard as a, as a mocking word, as a humiliating word, as a word to denigrate someone else. Don't be such a retard. Lucky he dropped the ball. Come on, you retards. It's all over our sporting fields. Um, it's not necessarily meant to denigrate a child with Down syndrome, but the subtle message is that when you drop the ball, when you don't act properly, when you act clumsily, you're like a retard. You're like a person with an intellectual disability. This stigma is all around us still, and our movement, we believe, is there to try to combat it. That's why we've launched the Special Olympics Unified Sports Movement. It's not new, uh, but it is only now finding its footing. Uh, we like to remind people that Special Olympics is not an event. It is a movement. It is not about them. It's about all of us. It's not a nice little to-do. It's an urgent mission of social change. It's not just about sports, but it's about sports at the center of a revolution in the hearts and minds and bodies of young people and cultures around the world. Our unified sports movement is designed to put children and adults, as I was in Waterbury, with and without intellectual differences, together as teammates, not as volunteer to recipient, not as helper to receiver, not as the strong to the weak, not as the one who has everything to the one who, oh, but for the grace of God, go I. No, none of that. It is designed to place us together, eye to eye, heart to heart, mind to mind, body to body, to learn through our bodies and through the physical expression of sports that we have so much more in common than that which separates us. We like to say on the field, we're teammates. We deliver, we think, the value proposition that off the field, we're friends. I'm going to skip these next two slides. You'll be happy to know. 
Uh, let me just tell you, this article ran last year. It was about a school here in Colorado that adopted unified sports. The principal says, unified has transformed the culture of this school. The young man pictured in the middle, um, Shane Powell notes, I was picked on, said Powell, who is, as they say in this newspaper, cognitively delayed and speaks in short, soft bursts. I felt very sad. But then goes on to say, the coach goes on to say, it's like any coaching experience I've ever had. I've never gotten teary-eyed during baseball or football. With Special Olympics, I fight back tears during every game. So I think the New York Times is trying to capture what happened in one school. Uh, it's the kind of message and the kind of change that can happen in almost any school in the country, we believe. Uh, where, so where do we want to be? We have a bold vision, and that's why I'm here. Every school, every school has a boys' sports team, every school that has a girls' sports team has a Special Olympics unified sports team too. Why shouldn't the right to play on a sports team in high school be accorded to a person with Down syndrome? Why? Think of the assumption. The assumption we've lived with since we started sports in schools, the assumption we believe in, in by our actions, not by our words, is that he's not good enough to play scholastic sports. He doesn't deserve the chance to wear a uniform because he's not good enough. What do we say to a child with autism when they go into school? You can play here, but you're not going to play for your high school. Why? You're not good enough. You're not good enough to warrant the honor, the right, the joy, the participation to play on your sports team. That's what we say, all of us together, until now. Until we believe, if you ask me, until we believe wholeheartedly in the idea that sports ought to be offered to everybody regardless of their ability level. That's the premise of Special Olympics. The premise is that when you do your best, when you train hard, when you go to see your coach and you practice day after day and you give your body everything you've got, you deserve the chance to win. And that's the premise we hope, together with you, we can bring to schools around the country. What will it look like? It'll look like great athletes. That's what it'll look like. Martin Luther King said everybody can be great because everybody can serve. We believe that. Greatness comes not just in the time of your finish, but in the courage and the bravery you muster in the pursuit of the goal. Our athletes can show their communities, their schools, their families, their country a definition of greatness that in so many corners has not yet been seen. So. These are some pictures. This is what it might look like because this is what it looks like already. So many of you have joined this, uh, this revolution already. This is uh, field day for Special Olympics Unified in uh, Rhode Island, uh, here in uh, another state, here in another state. Look at these young people with and without disabilities, cheering at sporting events, united in the belief that sports has brought them together learning the ideals of human togetherness and human belonging and doing it without being forced to, without being told to sit down and you know, do a test on it, without being coerced. I just can't imagine any of my five children learning more than they would learn if they were in that Congo line in school. Maybe on the field they might learn just as much. How do we get there? Very briefly, partnerships. You guys are the key, we believe, uh, to the partnership that can change the country. Connecticut was the first, as many of you know, uh, to create an interscholastic Special Olympics partnership uh, some almost now 20 years ago. We have several other states that are following, Alaska and Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Indiana, Maryland, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, 13 adding and more. Uh, this train, my friends, if you ask me, is leaving the station and we're riding it together. Uh, we've got a lot of impetus, not just from our own partnerships, but from the U.S. Department of Education. Many of you know this guidance that came out just a few months ago, uh, suggesting that there are civil rights issues uh, when children with intellectual challenges or other kinds of disabilities are denied the chance to participate. We know this doesn't go so far as to require anything, 
but it should remind us of the opportunity we have, those of us in sports, uh, to be at the avant-garde, not to wait for lawsuits, not to wait for administrators, not to wait for boards of education, not to wait for federal bureaucrats to come tell us how to run sports, but to welcome the chance to become the avant-garde leaders of promoting inclusion in our schools. We also have a third tool. We have our partnership, we have the government, and now we have, I think, a third tool, which is young people themselves. This generation, in my view, is markedly different around the issues of inclusion. In the past, we've defined generations by external events, by history, by the silent generation, or the baby boom generation, or you know, the millennials, or generation Y, all defined by things that happen around them. We believe that this generation can be defined not by something that happened to them, but by something they make happen, that this can be the generation that believes in unified, the unified generation, or as we like to think of it, Gen U. Never before has a society defined a future generation by vision, by actions, by things we hope to see in the world. I believe our young people themselves, when invited to join, to participate, even to organize unified sports teams alongside their existing sports programs, will welcome the chance to lead and to do so with vigor and enthusiasm. So in, in closing, let me just say very briefly, uh, we believe in unity. We believe that the human family has more in common than yet we've dreamed. You took a quiz at the very beginning. But before we go to that quiz, let me give you just one short story. Last two weeks ago, we received a letter from a parent uh, in Alaska. Her son with autism had been given the chance to participate on a Special Olympics Unified team in partnership with their school. She wrote to the general mailbox of Special Olympics Alaska, my son Gillian just had the best weekend of his life. For the past three years, she wrote, my son has been an angry and suicidal young man. I have been so afraid of losing him. Worst part is he knows about his disability. Bullied for most of his school career, he doesn't trust people, especially teachers and students. When I made him go out for Special Olympics track, I never dreamed he would have this opportunity. I just prayed that with a little bit of pushing from me and the patience of his coaches, he might feel a little accomplishment. He wanted to be part of a team. He wanted to be like everyone else. I know Gil isn't like everyone else, and so does he. But this weekend, for the first time, that was okay. He had autism and he was part of a team. It didn't have to be either or. He didn't just accomplish, he succeeded. This is the happiest I've seen him in a very long time. And the best thing is the past few weeks, Gil has not talked about hating himself. That is a gift I can never repay. She closes by saying, please forward this to all the Special Olympics Unified coaches. What they may not realize is they may have helped save Gil's life. We've been making changes, adding meds, therapies, you name it, to try to bring him down from the ledge he's been on. But the boost he's gotten from being part of a team, feeling accepted and supported, from, giving the, from being given the chance to win, all the meds and all the therapies have not been able to accomplish that. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. So you see, uh, I don't think there has ever been a time in which sports has been asked to lead a social revolution. We've had sit-ins that have led social revolutions. We've had lawyers that have read social, led social revolutions, politicians, citizen activists. To my knowledge, there has never been a moment in which sports, the physical activity, the expression of the body, the determination and grit to pull out of your body the best you've got. We've never found a time when that kind of work was invited to lead a social revolution. This population, those with intellectual disabilities, have been on the sidelines for millennia. Ancient Greece, ancient Rome, medieval Europe, you name it. Sidelines, discarded, forgotten, institutionalized, closed down, eliminated. 
we're at a time which I believe is historic. The momentum is there. The policymakers understand it. We have models within this room of how to do it. It's not expensive. It's not difficult. And it can change each of our lives. We started by asking, is it possible to have an undefeated season every year? I asked you the quiz, which one is the Special Olympics athlete? No, it's not possible to have an undefeated season every year if you're counting wins and losses. But if you're looking for relationships that matter, if you're seeking a flowering of hope, if you want to learn about the discovery of a joy that's always available in your life, yes, it's possible to have undefeated seasons. If you look at the picture, you might say, which one is the Special Olympics athlete? The answer is, they're both Special Olympics athletes. And I am proud to say I am also a Special Olympics athlete. And my purpose in coming here is to express to you the hope that each of you, in one way or another, will become Special Olympics athletes, too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, for your time with us here today, for your commitment, the commitment of your family to serving our students.